this is Amanda. Oh. Hey Amanda, will this? Uh, I guess I see it's recording. So will you will you be uploading this recording thing uh, later? Yes, yes, I got approval to um, record, and I'll um, if y'all want a copy of it, then send me a email individually, and I'll send it back. Awesome. Oh, Man. <laughs> hey, Amanda, are you going to send out slides or are we just going to be typing furiously? Either one. Just wondering. So, yeah, so I'm not going to send out the slides right now because my slides include the answers to the questions. So it would kind of, you know, defeat the purpose. But, um, but I will send a copy out um, afterwards if, if that if that would, if y'all want that. Yes, please. Uh, will you be planning to send in like after the session's over or tomorrow? Um, I'll go ahead and upload it after the session's over. If, um, is that, is that what Yeah, that'll, mean? that'll be awesome. That'll be awesome. Okay. So okay. Yep. Mm
Okay, um, I just posted the sign in sheet for um, the Google Doc sign in sheet for this session. So on, on Facebook, so if y'all wouldn't mind um, putting your names on that, I'll send out an email too. And then I'm trying to get one last thing to work here and then I'll get started. Where did you post the Google Sheet? Sorry, for sign-in. No problem. Uh, I posted it on the Facebook page. Did it not make its way there? I don't know. I'm working on it. Don't don't bet on that. It's not there. Let me go check. It. <laughs> <laughs> and I also just sent it via email too. So. I see it, I see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, so I was trying to have this in my mind. I had this really great idea that I was gonna, um, you know, have it like set up with like a poll or whatever. So it, like, cause I, so you could like answer my question. I could see like, you know, kind of gauge how well or not y'all understand it and whether I need to spend more or less time talking on it. But apparently um, my access that I have to Zoom is not the fancy type. So um, anyhow, so it wouldn't let me poll and, I tried to see if there was something online or whatever I could do, but um, it's not going to work. So y'all are just going to have to be brave and yell out an answer to me. So I apologize. But um, Okay, let's see. 
<laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for the support, Thomas. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Looks like people are working their way, signing in on that thing. Awesome. So um, I guess real quick, before I pull up to PowerPoint, um, I'll just kind of say some kind of general so you have an idea of, of how we're, this will run. So um, I have 30 questions for y'all. And um, all of them are going to be uh, USMLE step one styled. And um, what we'll do is I'll put the answer, or not the answer, I'll put the question up there with the answer choices, um, give y'all some time to think about it. Um, and then we'll go ahead and we can have someone or everyone or whoever um, call out an answer for me. And um, then we'll go, I'll show the next, I'll show the correct answer. Um, and then on the next slide, what I'll do is I'll have a little bit of information. So like whatever disease it is that we're talking about, I'll have kind of like a slide that kind of covers that um, disease. Um, as far as those go, those should be pretty comprehensive for whatever disease we're talking about. It, that information should be um, pretty much what you need to know for the test. Um, and then I'll also have a few questions over on the side that um, bonus questions that um, kind of run through anything, any information related to whatever topic that question was about or any kind of additional stuff that I think is important that you need to know for the exam. Um, full disclosure, there'll be a few questions on here that are beyond the scope of the exam. They're just some stuff that I found in studying for STEP that um, the school hadn't really covered. No offense to them. I think their curriculum is great, but um, that they were pretty big ideas on step one. So I just wanted to throw them in there, just looking, and I'll let you know when we come to those so that you don't like stress out, like where did I miss this in lecture or something. Um, those are just for your own edification for when you um, begin your step studying. Um, let's see, also, so um, as far as this, like kind of the way that this exam is gonna work, or at least the way it worked for us, and I would assume the way that they'll do it for y'all as well. Um, when um, when it comes to the types of questions that'll be on there, they're really not gonna, because I know if, if y'all are anything like me, then when y'all began like last week, this first unit or this first, um, yeah, first week of classes in this unit, it felt like there was just so much information coming at you. It felt like you were like being run over by a bus. Um, maybe y'all are better than that, but I was not. And so, um, but rest assured that on the exam, the questions are not gonna be like, um, what come, what is the third step of the compliment cascade? You know, it's, it's not going to be like that. Um, it's really, they're the only parts of the different processes that they're going to test you on are going to be the parts where things can go wrong. So they're going to test you really, and this is a theme throughout a lot of second, pretty much all of second year. They're going to test you on the pathology, not per se on, can you like, tell me exactly what happens in this process if that makes sense. Um, so if there's nothing really that can go wrong with that step of, you know, T cell maturation or um, the complement cascade or whatever, probably we shouldn't, probably don't worry too much about it, um, stressing every detail um, as far as them asking a question. It'll, it'll pretty much pertain to things that can go wrong. So, um, Let's see, anything else that I want to tell you all before we start? Um, I don't think so. Okay, if I think of something as we go, then I will let y'all know. So let me go ahead and get this uh, PowerPoint pulled up for y'all. And if y'all have any questions as we go through, throughout, just stop me and um, get my attention. Uh, let's see. Look. 
Okay. And again, this is not intended to be comprehensive of the entire unit. Um, just, you know, for liability sake, that's not what I'm going for. But, um, but I think it covers a lot of the main ideas here. So, um, okay. Y'all ready? Maybe. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, gotcha. I don't have the chat pulled up. Uh, okay, okay, but I do have it pulled up now. And to answer your question, uh, somebody had sent me, will I be sending out? Yes, I can send out the PowerPoint afterwards. Um, it has the answer, so I'm not gonna send it out before. Um, and it'll be recorded, so if you want a copy of the recording, email me individually. I'm gonna minimize the chat now, so, so it's not in my way. So if you have a question, you'll have to actually come off of mic and, um, or come off of mute and chat it out. Okay, so here we go. Let's see, did it work for me? Or is it not going? Okay, there we go. Alrighty, so let me move this box out of the way. Okay, so, um, I'll read, I'll go ahead and read it to y'all because I don't know what else to do with my time if I don't. So an eight-year-old male is brought to his pediatrician's office by his mother. Um, the child has a runny nose, sore throat, cough, low-grade fever for the past 24 hours. Patient's mother recalls that several of the child's friends have been ill recently with similar symptoms. Mother asks whether the child will need antibiotics for his condition. His pediatrician recommends symptomatic therapy and feels that his illness is most likely a viral etiology. Cytotoxic CD8 plus uh, lymphocytes are able to kill virus-infected nasal epithelial cells once sensitized as the receptors become able to recognize foreign proteins on the epithelial cell surface. These foreign proteins are presented on the epithelial cell surface by MHC molecules. These MHC molecules are composed of which of the following components? So a lot of fluff just to ask you a very simple question that you either know or you don't know. Um, I'll give you all a second to think about it, and then here in a second, I will ask for um, some answers. Okay, so what are y'all thinking? Was that enough time to think about it? Yes. Okay. So what are, what are, what are we thinking? All right. We got one person who says, uh, beta to B. Okay. We got some people going with B. So yes, that is correct. So B is the correct answer. Let's see. Damn it. Okay. There we go. All right. So yes. So this is kind of a, um, either you know it or you don't type thing. But so let's talk a little bit about MHC class one molecules. So um, let's see, let's go back then. So what, what cells in the body are going to be, um, are going to express MHC class one molecules? All nucleated cells. Exactly, all nucleated cells. So what type of, oh, it's on my slide there. So, but good job anyways, Hannah. And so what types of cells then in the body would you not expect to see these presented on? Red blood cells. Red blood. red blood cells. Yeah, absolutely. And that'll be, um, I, if I remember correctly, we had a question on our test about that. Um, they, I know exactly, it wasn't like straightforward like that, but basically they wanted you to say that um, red blood cells would not have these because they don't have a nucleus. Absolutely. And so what, um, so when, so first off, where do um, class one MHC, where do they get their antigens from? Where are they going to be pulling those from? So yes, yeah, so I'm so well. First off, what type of antigens will they display? Antigens from what type of pathogens? Intracellular. Intra. Intracellular. Good. Well, sorry. Did you have something else? No, sorry. I was just agreeing. Intracellular. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So intracellular. So what is probably the primary intracellular pathogen that we think of when we think of intracellular pathogens? Viruses. 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 Absolutely. So viruses will be presented on um, on class one. Um, also, we um, there are certain bacteria that can um, that will that are primarily intracellular. Um, so, anybody have an example of one of those? Chlamydia. Yep, that's a good one. Yep, uh, cl uh, chlamydia, uh, listeria. Um, 
anything that is going to be found in the cytoplasm, anything that can escape the phagolysosome. So absolutely. And so um, also what other type of cells? So we said viruses, intracellular bacteria slash fungi, and then what other type of, not necessarily a pathogen per se, but what other types of cell um, abnormalities will be displayed on MHC1? Tumors? Tumors, absolutely. So your cancer cells will also be displayed on class one. Um, so um, yes. So uh, what organelle then is going to be important within the cell in processing these intracellular cytoplasmic antigens for presentation on class one molecules? Proteasome? Yeah, exactly, the proteasome, that's right. So the proteasome, remember, um, not to insult anyone's intelligence, but just, uh, so it's, um, it's kind of like uh, uh, the, uh, what were those called, shredders inside the cell. And um, any old proteins or foreign material or junk that we need to get rid of, it's gonna shred that up. So yes, yeah, so all of the antigens are gonna go through um, the proteasome first, and then they're going to be translocated into what organelle? ER or Golgi? Yeah, so the rough ER generally, but yeah, the endoplasmic reticulum. And what, um, what protein, what's the acronym for that protein, which we'll talk about in a later slide, but what's the acronym for that protein that um, what facilitates that transfer into the rough ER? TAP? Yep, exactly, exactly. Y'all are on top of it, great. And so when we display these intracellular pathogens on our MHC class one molecule, um, who are we going, well, I already have it on my slide, but who are we going to be presenting it to? CD8. CD8. And what is the role of CD8 cells? Cytotoxic. Cytotoxic. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Um, let's see. I think that's what I want to say on there. So um, let's, oh, and then, so which part of the MHC molecule? So we said that there's um, we decided on that previous slide, there's a heavy chain and there's a beta-2 macroglobulin. And so which of those two parts is going to be the part that um, allows for antigen recognition and display? The heavy chain? Yeah, exactly, the heavy chain. Um, they can, that's, yeah, that's why I have on my slide here that they're um, highly polymorphic because, uh, yes, because that way they can change to accommodate different types of antigens. Absolutely. Okay. So now for the bonus questions. So which answer choice, and I can flip back, um, is the uh, would be the composition of MHC class two molecules. D, D the alpha and beta chain. Absolutely. D like dog. That's right. That would be your alpha and beta chain. Um, and then so talking about MHC class two molecules, which cells are going to have those? CD4. So that's who they present to, you're absolutely right, but who is going to actually carry them and display these antigens? antigen? Professional antigen pre presenting cells. Absolutely, antigen presenting cells. And so what are some examples of antigen presenting cells? B cells, macrophages. Mm -hmm. Dendritic, dendritic cells. cells, yep. And then Langerhans cells, which are kind of like dendritic cells in the skin. So yes, yeah. absolutely. Good job. Um, and then we already said that they're going to present to CD4 cells. And um, what is the role of CD4 cells? Or what are the roles uh, of CD4 cells? They're helper cells that help activate the B cell. Exactly. So that's one role that they can do. And um, so would we call that a your would we call that a Th1 or Th2 response if they go and then activate B cells? Should be Th2. Absolutely, good. And then so what would the Th1 response then be? Makes angry macrophages. Yeah, so we call that like, we call it a cell mediated response. So absolutely, yeah, really good guys. And um, the way I always remember, if, if maybe y'all don't have a problem keeping them straight, but the way I always remember it is like, you wanna look for the problem like inside first. So cell mediated is TH1 and then you fix the problems outside TH2. I don't know, that's stupid. That's how I remember it. Okay, so yeah, TH1 cell mediated TH2 is antibody or extracellular um, response, good. 
Okay. Um, then, so where do these cells get their antigens from? The uh, professional presenting, uh, antigen presenting cells. Extracellular. Extracellular, good. So how do they get them inside of them then? Phagocytosis. Absolutely. Yep. So um, they're gonna um, they're gonna absolutely take them in via phagocytosis, fuse with the lysosome to create a phagolysosome. Um, and so these will not need to be processed by the proteasome because the lysosome is going to do that for us. Um, and then they can just be directly placed into um, an MHC class two molecule. I believe they kind of move through the Golgi to do that, but um, that part's really not important. Um, it's just um, important that you know that those are coming from lysosomes from outside the cell and they're getting put on an MHC2 versus the other ones. MHC1 will come from inside the cell, in the cytoplasm, and they're being um, processed by the uh, proteasome. And then I think I have one more question up there. Yes, so uh, then what, uh, we already talked about that. Ah, y'all are so smart. Okay, all righty. Um, okay, so y'all ready to go to the next question? All right, nobody said no, so we're gonna go. All right, two. Um, a 44-year-old man with a chronic cough, cough and progressive weight loss uh, comes to the emergency department. He's lost 11 pounds over the past three months, recently immigrated from Southeast Asia. Temperature 37.4, blood pressure 113 over 70, pulse 78, respirations 18. Uh, chest x-ray reveals an apical left lung infiltrate. Sputum gram stain and cultures are negative. Uh, lung bi biopsy shows acid fast bacilli. Um, I have a picture um, of a tissue stain for you in the bottom right. Um, and so the structure that the arrow is pointing to most likely resulted from which of the following? Whenever y'all are ready, y'all can shout out any. I can't see, I, I don't have the chat pulled up, so. Um. I personally have no clue, but I'll guess fibroblast. Okay, so you're thinking that that's a scar right there, some kind of scar formation? It's, it's possible. <laughs> I appreciate you answering and playing along. So that, that, and, and um, by the end of your second year, you'll be able to kind of see the difference, but at first it is kind of tricky. So um, you do see a lot of eosinic material here, which could be mistaken for a, um, a scar. Um, first, if we were, first off, if we were to just look at the question itself, though, the symptomology and everything, what would we think this patient has? Like what kind of diagnosis would we slap on him? I think it's a TB illness and that's a granuloma. There we go. Yes, exactly. So yes, he does have TB um, given the weight loss um, south from Southeast Asia. It's a very chronic type of thing. Um, the apical, um, the primary, um, I'm sorry, reactivation TB tip, uh, tends to present the apex of the lungs because of the oxygen tension there. Um, so yeah, so he has TB, so that, that's kind of one clue that you can help use. Um, uh, the acid fast bacilli also would be suggestive of some kind of mycobacteria. Um, and so yes, so um, TB does create granulomas, and specifically would the granulomas in TB be caseating or non-caseating? Caseating. Caseating, yeah, because they get necrotic in the center. If they were non-caseating, um, you that would be indicative of no um, no dead material in the center. So yeah, so this is a granuloma, and so some things that we can do to identify it as a granuloma. So first off, you see a bunch of nuclei that are kind of um, grouped together around the edge without really clear um, like cell borders. What do you think is going on there? What what are these nuclei a part of? What type of cell has been created? Uh, 
Is it the giant cells? Yes, absolutely. Giant cells, histiocytes, those are both names for the same thing. Yeah. And so basically what happens, well, so, um, well, so what type of, I don't know if I've said it already, but what type of cells fuse to make those giant cells? Macrophages. Macrophages. And so we just talked about previously, what, how are these macrophages going to be activated? Th1. By Th1, yep. So which, what would be our answer choice then there? E. E, yep, absolutely. So that one was a really tricky one because if you just look at the picture, it does kind of look like a scar formation. You might think, well, there's been some kind of damage and it's scarring. Um, what you have to do is you have to identify, um, first off, kind of what's going on with the patient generally, and then also identify these giant cells right here that have been formed by the fusion. So absolutely. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else that I wanted to. Um, so um, let's see. So just talking real quick about kind of how the body deals with TB. So first, um, which this is kind of a flashback from um, your mic, uh, your uh, yes, micro in the spring. But so first you have your, um, uh, your acid fast bacilli, they get phagocytose, they proliferate within the macrophages because they're able to make this thing called cord factor that kind of makes them resistant to degradation. But then um, after several weeks, um, these macrophages become these angry phages that I think someone had mentioned previously. And um, uh, that occurs upon stimulation by the um, CD4 helper cells with their Th1 response. Um, and so what specifically um, is released to activate these macrophages? I think I have it on my slide, but. Interferon gamma. Yep, interferon gamma, absolutely. That's what causes them to, to switch to these angry phages. Um, and vice versa, what do macrophages secrete that activates CD4 cells to initiate a Th1 response? I don't think I have this one on my slide. IL-12. Absolutely, good job guys, yes. Um, IL-12, exactly. And so it's kind of this um, reciprocal activation um, with them secreting their cytokines back and forth, absolutely. Um, and so then what happens because um, uh, because we can't really fully um, control the infection, we try to wall it off. So these macrophages fuse to form these um, histiocytes and these Langhans giant cells, which not to be confused with the Langerhans um, that you find they're more like dendritic cells. Um, and so you just kind of get this wall around the bacteria. The bacteria start to die inside. You get these caseating granulomas. Um, have y'all talked about any other conditions, um, not necessarily infectious, that cause granuloma formation or no? Actually, I actually had a question on that. Yeah. Um, is multinucleated giant cells from like mumps and stuff like that, or like all those infections, is that different than the other giant cells or like is multinucleated versus these? How are those different exactly? That's a great question. And they are different, um, number one, in kind of the way they look. Um, because um, a granuloma is going to have a very distinct look with that kind of around the, um, the edges, and a lot of times you'll have the caseating um, in the center. Um, those other ones are going to look more like, um, it'll just be like a single giant epithelial cell emits normal-ish epithelium, um, and also their etiology is a little bit different. So um, the things like you see with like, say, um, an HSV infection or something, herpes simplex, those are actually gonna be due to viral, um, uh, viral changes that are occurring in the cell um, and viral effects on the cell. So the etiology is a bit different and they'll look a little bit different on histology too. Is that it? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so bonus questions. So A, what, so A was, let's see. Um, a was activation of CD8 lymphocytes. So um, what would that occur in response to? We already talked about it a little bit earlier. Like an intracellular pathogen? Absolutely, intracellular pathogen. Or it, on, on an MH1 class, MHC class one? 
Absolutely, exactly. All of that is correct. Um, so B, that one was B cell transformation. What virus could cause that? Epstein Barr virus. Yep, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. That would be a cancerous change, uh, a malignant transformation that we would be talking about there. Absolutely. Um, so, well, we already kind of talked about this, the fibroblast prol proliferation. That's basically, um, that's basically a scar formation. And you do have some um, like collagen depth and fibrin deposition in the formation of a granuloma. That's not the primary process that's occurring right here. Um, and then the last one, um, so that was neutrophil infiltration. What type of um, pathogen would this occur um, in response to? Could you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. So D, that was neutrophil infiltration. What type of pathogen would we expect to see um, neutrophil inf infiltration occurring in response to, just broadly? Bacteria. Bacteria, absolutely. Specifically extracellular bacteria. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to the third question. Um, an eight-year-old boy is brought to the pediatrician with fever, runny nose, malaise. After examining the child, pediatrician determines that uh, that's supposed to be the child, has a viral infection and does not require any specific treatment. Mother asks why an antibiotic is not necessary and physician explains the differences between bacterial and viral infections. Um, the immune system is composed of both cellular and humoral components, which are able to mount an effective response against many types of viral and bacterial infections. A section of normal lymph nodes is shown in the image on the bottom right. The structures indicated by the arrows are most likely to contain cells undergoing which of the following processes? Would it be A? Yep, it would be A, absolutely. What are those, what are those things right there? Germinal, the germinal centers. centers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna use this slide to talk a bit about kind of the process of um, B cell activation. So first off, B cells are going to be formed and grow up where in the body? Bone marrow. Yep, absolutely, in the bone marrow. And so after they are um, mature, they're grown up, they're gonna leave the bone marrow and they're gonna go out to the body where they start um, looking for their antigen. And once they find their antigen, they become activated um, and they start to proliferate. And so some of these right off the bat are gonna go ahead and produce what type of antibody? IgM. IgM. And so what, tell me about what, what is IgM good for? Like an immediate, un, like non-specific response? Absolutely. So IgM, it's, um, it has that pentamer shape. Um, so it has lots of binding sites, but like you, exactly like you said, they're not very specific. So um, what'll happen is we have a, um, the avidity is great with a V, but affinity with an F is not so great. So it's good for just kind of in, um, initially binding a bunch of things. Um, so IgM is gonna be our primary response to an acute infection. Um, and then so after that, as those cells, that subset of, of B cells are producing IgM, the rest of the cells are gonna go to, um, to the lymph nodes and um, they're going to uh, differentiate, they're going to class, uh, class switch into what type of antibody then? C, A, or E. Huh? Did you say G, A, or E? Yeah, G, A, or E. Yep, absolutely, depending on the, um, on the particular type of infection that's going on. Um, and so the thing, so IgG, so what is that good for? It's more specific. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it is, it's just one of them. Um, so it's just a single, um, 
antibody. It's highly specific, so it has high affinity, less avidity, and it's good for um, finally eliminating the infection because it binds very specifically and very tightly. And what's also special about IgG? It's the one antibody that can do what? Cross the placenta. Absolutely, cross the placenta. Um, so then what, what disease then or condition might we be worried about um, in pregnancy then that has to do with IgG? I think Dr. Bright talked about it. Is it like the hemolytic disease of the newborn? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I have a slide further down that'll talk about that. So we'll save that for them, but exactly. Um, okay, and then so IgA, what kind of antibody is that? What is that one good for? Mucus and breast milk. Yes, ab absolutely. So it's gonna be your mucosal membranes, uh, yes. And how? what's the structure of that one? if it's on a mucous membrane? Dimeric. Dimer, absolutely. If it's in the serum, it'll, it'll just be in a single form, but a monomer. But if it's on the actual mucous membranes, it'll be a dimer. And um, do y'all remember the name of the receptor that transports it across? FC alpha two or something? Um, I'm not- Poly ID receptor? Yes, the, the pig A receptor is going to be the one that, um, that carries it across. And um, I think I have a slide talking about that a little bit later as well. So, um, yes. Um, okay, which bullet was I on there? Um, okay, and so when we have this um, isotype class switch, um, what, what part of the... Um, what, 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 um, how do I want to ask this question? What, uh, what receptors are being, are communicating here when this is happening? There's a receptor on a B cell and a receptor on a T cell. What are those receptors when we're undergoing acetype switching? Is it CD40 and C40L? Yep, absolutely. Which one's on which? Uh, CD40L is on T cells, and CD40 is yep. on B cells. Yep, absolutely. And um, so in the CD40 ligand that's on T cells, another term for that that you might see, probably not on your test, but like just when you're studying for step, is going to be a CD154. That's the other name for that ligand there. And um, so uh, let's see. Which, and so which region of the, um, of the antibody is going to be the one that changes here? The effector region. So, yes, yeah, so, so um, if we were gonna call it heavy chain, light chain, what would, you, what would we call that? It would be the heavy chain in the constant region. Yes, exactly, yep, yep, exactly. That's how you'll see it asked on your test, yep. Absolutely. Um, oh, I have it on my slide, don't I? Okay. Alrighty. And so um, then a subset of those cells um, after the infection will go and remain dormant. We call those memory cells and upon re-exposure, they're stimulated again. Okay. Um, so for the bonus questions over here. So B, that was negative selection. So where does... Um, where does a uh, negative, tell, someone tell me about what negative selection is. First off, which cell does negative selection apply to? T cells. T, T cells. And so, um, and so what, what happens in negative selection? So the T cells that don't attack the self are allowed to pass through the test? Exactly, exactly. So the reason it's called negative selection is because if you're selected, you're, you, um, you're, you're killed off. So the T cells that bind too strongly to um, self antigens, exactly like you said, are going to be killed off and that is what prevents autoimmune type diseases from occurring. Um, and so where does that occur in what organ? Thymus. Thymus, yep. And um, do you and I have thymuses? 
Degenerated. They, exactly. Yeah. So mostly fatty tissue. Exactly. Yep. Um, okay. And then let's see. So C, that's tolerance development. Um, so where, where does this occur at? Does this occur in the thymus or does this occur in the periphery? Kind of a trick question. It can occur both places. So if we're, um, if we're talking about central tolerance, where would this occur? That would bone be marrow? Yeah, bone marrow. Uh, yeah, so bone marrow if we're talking about B cells and thymus if we're talking about um, T cells. That would occur during the process of negative selection. If we're talking about peripheral tolerance, specifically with T cells, what, what's the process for this? There's a certain term for that when we inactivate T cells that kind of escape that initial um, negative selection. What, what do we call that? Energy. Energy, yep, exactly, T cell energy. So basically cells that are, have made it somehow past negative selection or, and are still too reactive to self antigens. We have um, T regulatory cells that go and um, inactivate them before they can do too much damage. And then, so the last one, so that's the VDJ and VJ rearrangement. So um, somebody tell me what these processes, um, what those are referring to there. What, what do they, what do those process, what's the end result there? What's the end game? It gives you var variability and um, specificity to different antigens, correct? Yep, exactly, exactly. That's how you get all the different um, uh, cells that recognize all these different um, types of antigens. Um, so which one of those out of VD and V or out of VDJ and VJ, which one is going to be for which? Because obviously you have a heavy chain variable region and a light chain variable region. Which one is going to be for which? VDJ on heavy, VJ on light. Yep, exactly, exactly. And um, let's see. And so it occurs via DNA rearrangement, which I think you already said right there. And um, where is this going to occur in the body? The bone marrow? Yep, exactly, in the bone marrow. Absolutely. And then so what other B cell process is, is this kind of similar to that occurs in um, germinal centers later on? Traumatic hypermutation. Yep, exactly. So the affinity maturation that occurs um, as we produce um, antibodies with greater specificity. Yep, exactly. Okay, so number four, I'll just let y'all read it to yourselves. And then when someone wants to shout out an answer, then y'all go on ahead. Is the answer C? Uh, which one? C, persistent leukocytosis. Yep, absolutely. Very good. So um, what does this patient have here? Leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So um, first off, the, the, the first thing I should tip you off is the um, infections that don't have pus. Why is there no pus there? Because the leukocytes can't get to the site of infection from the blood vessel. Exactly, exactly. And that's also why these infections are going to occur on skin and mucosal surfaces because um, everything within the bloodstream, I mean, you have tons of neutrophils there, but they can't get out. So that's exactly right. And for that same reason, you're also going to have um, poor wound healing because neutrophils participate in the wound healing process. And you're going to have... Um, the delayed um, separation of the umbilical cord, which kind of goes along with um, poor wound healing there. And then because these neutrophils can't get out of the bloodstream, you're just gonna have a super high number of them um, present circulating around. So um, 
And then um, infections, usually what you'll see, they're gonna be either staph aureus or they're gonna be gram-negative rods um, in these patients. I, I can't exactly tell you why, um, uh, but I guess because neutrophils maybe play a greater role in their um, elimination than, the, than they would in other pathogens, but that's also, that, that, won't, that part won't be tested, but that's just something for um, step studying. Um, and so what is, um, uh, well, I mentioned it down there, but so what's, what, what is missing on these cells um, that prevents them from being able to get out? It's, it's the integrins, right? They don't have integrins, so they can't get out. What, what is the complement of integrins that's located on the blood vessels? Get them an eye cam. The eye cam and B cam. Yes, and so, but generally, what do we kind of call that class? Are they selectins? Yes, exactly. So the way I remember is that selectins, which I think we had a question about that, selectins are on the vessels because they select the cells to get pulled out, and then integrins are on the um, white blood cells themselves because they integrate into the tissues. I don't know if that helps um, keep those two straight. Maybe you didn't have a problem keeping those two straight. But so I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So selectins and then the ICAM, VCAM, what's the difference between those, like where they are? Or to be honest, there probably is a difference between them. I think it's like whether they're located on the apical versus basolateral. But don't quote me on that. I'm not. I'm not exact. I couldn't. I can't give you a really confident answer. But they won't test you on the difference between the two as long as you know which ones are on the vessels, which ones are on the the white blood cells. So okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so for bonus question, so um, A, that was infection following live virus vaccines. Who would be at risk for that? Who should not give live virus get live virus vaccines? Any immunocompromised. Um, yes, relatively. Um, specifically, what do you need intact in order to mount um, an immune response to um, to any kind of infection. Part of the immune system absolutely needs to be functioning for you to even have an immune system. Or your T cells? Yeah, one. yeah your T cells. So um, people, uh, people who have skid, any sort of the skid syndromes um, and HIV, those people would have an absolute contraindication to live virus vaccines. Um, by and large, most other immunodeficiencies can actually be safely given live virus vaccines. It's, um, it's uh, predominantly just the people who have that T cell deficiency part. Um, and then as far as B, that was infection with Neisseria. So what would that pre, um, uh, or what would, what would predispose a person to Neisseria infections? C5 through C9 deficiencies. Absolutely, so terminal complement, exactly. And because those form the what? MAP complex. Membrane attack complex. Yep, membrane attack complex. Absolutely. Um, so D, that was absent, small or absent lymph nodes. Um, what, what would that um, make? Which immunodeficiency would that make you think of? B cell deficiency. A B cell deficiency, exactly. If you don't have a B cell deficiency, you can't, um, you won't have any um, lymphoid tissue because you don't have any germinal centers or primary follicles forming. And so specifically, what is a, um, um, an important B cell deficiency that y'all need to know? X-linked A gamma globulinemia. Absolutely, yes. The X-linked A gamma globulinemia, yep. Um, so those people, one of the like key things that they'll put in the question is that on exam, they don't have tonsils, no lymph nodes are palpable, That'll, that should kind of tip you off. Um, and then E, that was thrombocytopenia and eczema. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a triad of three things, thrombocytopenia, eczema, and delayed separation of the umbilical cord. And whenever you hear those three in combo, what should you immediately think of? 
you might not have had this lecture yet. It might it might not be until um, Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Yep, exactly. Wiscott Aldrich. And so that one is the only one that's going to have like bleeding problems too. So if you hear that triad of um, either immunodeficiency or delayed separation of the umbilical cord, along with eczema, along with thrombocytopenia, so low platelets, that, or if you hear about a patient who has an immunodeficiency and some kind of bleeding problem, that should immediately tip you off to Wiscott Aldridge. Yep, good job. Um, just for, for bonus, do you know um, what is wrong in, in Wiscott Aldridge? What's the, at the um, like cellular level, what's going on there? I think I might have a slide later on about it, but. I do not. <laughs> okay, that's okay, that's okay. Sorry, you, you were nice enough to answer and then I pimped you on it. But, so it's an X, so it's gonna be an X-linked issue. So that means it's gonna be more common in what? Men, male. Boys, yep. And it's um, a cytoskeletal defect. So um, that's why you get the, um, the involvement with platelets is because it's a certain, uh, component of the cytoskeleton. Okay, awesome. So there's number five for you. I'll move my pointer out of the way. This one is a little bit tricky and my, this one might be a little bit um, beyond the scope of the exam um, as far as what you need to know to make the connection between the graph and the answer choice, but you will almost certainly see a graph like this on your exam, which is why I included it in, in this little question thing. Is it getting at the fact that MHC2 would be impaired, so presentation of antigens processed in lysosomes? Yep, you're exactly right. Yep. Let's see. Why is it not coming off for me? There we go. Yes, that's exactly right. So um, basically, you kind of have to know several things here. First, you have to know what all of these things on the side mean. So CD3, that would be indicative of what? T cell receptor function? Yeah, that, so that's your T cells. I think Dr. Bright said any little number is basically, if you want to take a guess, it's probably going to be if it's a CD little number, it's going to be a T cell. Um, CD19 would be indicative of what? Oh. T cells. So our patient, uh, as far as um, B and T cells go, they, they seem to line up with our healthy control. So then what you kind of have to know is what, which HLA is going to be your class two and which HLA is going to be your class one. And that part is probably what's beyond the scope of y'all's exam. So, um, but it will not be beyond the scope, scope of step. So um, anything that has a D, like that has um, like a DR, DQ, DP, um, at those type of HLAs, those are gonna be your class two. And the way I remember it is because there's gonna be two letters right there and it's MHC class two. Your MHC class ones are going to be like HLA A, HLA B, HLA C. So there's only going to be one letter following the HLA, and so it'll it'll be class one, if that makes sense. So yeah. So then you need to know. Okay, so HLA uh, two is what this patient is um, lacking here, and then you would say, well, antigen presenting cells carry class two and antigen uh, presenting cells um, acquire their antigens via phagocytosis and lysosomes, um, lysosomal destruction. Um, let's see. And then, so what this patient, what we would diagnose him with then would be um, bare lymphocyte syndrome type 
2, and type 2 is specific to the MHC class 2 that's on your antigen presenting cells. And so this would basically, um, this would be classified as a form of SCID because they're, they're not going to be able to really amount any kind of um, immune response to anything outside of um, an intracellular pathogen. So, um, okay. Let's see, do I want to say anything else? I don't think so. So A, that was um, development of pharyngeal arches. What disease are we talking about there? De George, yep, exactly. Um, and so De George syndrome. So, does anybody know the um, specific gene that gets deleted there? The micro deletion. Twenty two Q eleven. Twenty two Q eleven, exactly. And that will be fair game for your test. Um, and so that's going to be an autosomal dominant. And um, so, what would our graph then? Those little graphs that we have there. What would what would they look like in our patient if we had a um, the George syndrome. No CD3. Yep, absolutely. You'd be missing the CD3 because you wouldn't have a thymus in the George syndrome and therefore you wouldn't be able to have T cell maturation. So you would effectively have no circulating T cells. I'll have a slide a little bit later on about the George. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so B, that was capability of activated CD4 T cells to express CD4L. What would, what syndrome would that be? Hyper IgM. Yes, exactly, because your CD4L ligand is involved in what process? Isotype switching. Yep, exactly, very good. Um, then C, that was maturation of pro-B cells into pre-B cells. Um, and so what, what disease is that? A gamma globinemia. Mm -hmm. Yep, the X-linked A gamma globulinemia. Um, and so how would that graph look? No CD19. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Um, and then what, do y'all know what the, um, the defect is in um, X-linked A gamma globulinemia? BKT. Yes, um, BTK. And what does that stand for? Does anybody know? Brutin tyrosine kinase. Yep, exactly. Very good. So um, the B cells need to receive a signal via that receptor in order to continue um, the maturation process. And so if it's broken, they don't get that signal. Yep, good job. Um, and so with that one, because I don't think I have a slide about it later, so I'll talk about it real quick right now. So obviously, as the name would suggest, you have um, uh, uh, hypogammaglobulinemia across the board, all types. And, um, but they don't start, um, you don't really start seeing the recurrent infections until around like three to six months of age. Why would that be? Maternal antibodies. Yep, exactly. And what type of maternal antibody would we be talking about? IgG. IgG, yep, good job. And so, yeah, so with that one, you basically don't have any mature B cells, so no antibodies to be had. And then the last one, that was transport of cytosolic proteins um, into the ER. And so um, what, what are some things, what, what would be missing in that instance? What are we describing? Could it be TAP? Mm -hmm. Yep, TAP proteins. Very good. Um, okay, there you go. There's your next question. Whenever y'all are good, y'all can shout it out.
Is it going to be B? It absolutely is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of already um, belabored that fact. So I'm not going to, um, let's see, I don't think there's anything on there that we really haven't mentioned. Oh, this, so the, um, the type, so bare lymphocyte syndrome type two, we said that that was a mutation in what component? on the previous slide, or slide before the previous one. MHC1. So MHC2, um, but yes, yeah, so that was in the MHC, but type one is going to be in the TAP gene. So this one's gonna affect your um, MHC1 presentation. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so the thing that you would see here is all of your um, immunoglobulin levels would be normal because um, uh, those would all be activated via what? MHC1 or 2? So antibodies would be for extracellular pathogens. And so extracellular pathogens would be presented on? MHC2. MHC2, yeah. So your immunoglobulin levels would be normal here. Um, lymphocyte levels would be normal, but you wouldn't have um, proper presentation on MHC1 um, molecules because you don't have that functioning TAP protein. Okay, so um, let's see. A was uh, B cell differentiation into plasma cells. So um, again, what would that be? Um, what would what would that result in? CVID. Mm -hmm. Yep, common variable immune deficiency. Yep, exactly. Um, and so that one, just a little bit about that one, because I don't think I have another slide about that. But so that one, um, there's not really a clear genetic cause of that one. We call it multifactorial. Um, and so basically you have um, decreased immunoglobulin levels overall because plasma cells are what specifically secrete um, immunoglobulins. Um, and so you just get recurrent like GI respiratory tract infections. Um, that one I wouldn't worry about too much for the test. Um, okay, so C, uh, that was destruction of phagocytized organisms. What uh, disease am I talking about there? Chronic granulomatous disease. Yep, absolutely. And um, do you, so what, do you know what the most common um, mutation or what the most common inheritance pattern is for that one? Excellent. That's the NADPH. Oh. Exactly, you are both correct. It's X-linked and X-linked uh, corresponds to NADPH oxidase. There's a autosomal recessive one and that corresponds to um, uh, myeloperoxidase. Uh, yes, so good job. Um, and I have a, another slide that will talk about that in more detail. But, um, and then so D, um, that was MHC class 2, um, and we already talked about that. We said that those are going to be loaded in phagolysosomes. And then um, E, that was migration and extravasation of neutrophils. And uh, what disease did we decide earlier that, that would occur in? Bad. Yep, leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Awesome. Okay, here's number seven. I promise these will start going faster because we have talked about most a lot of the things. Is it D? Uh, yes, ma'am, that is correct. So what is this patient missing? 
The spleen. The spleen. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so asplenic sepsis. So what type of cells then would these people particularly not have? Marginal zone B cells. Exactly. MZ cells. Yep. Uh, Dr. Krushek likes those cells. I think we got a question on those um, on our test last year. Uh, but yes, so um, the spleen, just as a side note for you to walk away in your memory, it's the most commonly injured um, organ with abdominal trauma. So that's if you have a patient, um, you know, on a step question or something, that's always something, if they have a, a history of that, a remote history, that's always something to kind of keep in mind. And so asplenic sepsis actually has like a 50% mortality rate. It's, it's pretty bad. So, um, and the reason being is because actually like over like half of the an, uh, antibodies produced in your body are produced by B cells that reside in the spleen. So normally you would have um, your red pulp where your, um, where the antigens would be and uh, cells would be filtered out and then presented to your B cells that reside in your white pulp. Um, yes, so that was really just the main point of that question right there. Um, A, that was complement production. So uh, what organ could potentially be damaged to impair complement production? Liver. Exactly. Your liver makes pretty much all of your complement components. Um, and uh, there's a certain complement component deficiency that would also um, predispose you to recurrent infections with encapsulated organisms. Does anybody know which complement um, component that would be? I think that, that's probably beyond the scope of your exam, but... So it would be C3. C3 would predispose you um, also to encapsulated organism infections. Okay, so B, that would be immediate hypersensitivity. And what would mediate that? Have y'all had your hypersensitivities lecture yet? No. IgE? Uh, yeah. Huh? Was it IgE? I really don't, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Following. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah I, I guess y'all are going to have that one later this week. So um, yes, so there's four types of hypersensitivity reactions. Um, type, and so type one, that's going to be like your allergies. Um, and so that exactly right. It's mediated by IgE and mast cells. Type two is going to be antibody mediated. So things like, um, say, Graves disease, um, where you have, or myasthenia gravis, where you have um, the pathology is... Um, is uh, mediated by um, uh, antibody binding to a certain cellular component. That's going to be your type two. Type three is going to be immune complex mediated. So things like lupus, um, serum sickness, uh, those things are going to be where you have immune complexes form between immuno, uh, immunoglobulins and antigens, and then those deposit in places and cause issues. Um, and then type four is going to be your um, cell mediated. So rheumatoid arthritis will fall under that category, but also in the one that they like to test you on or con is contact dermatitis. So um, things like exposure to, um, to uh, like poison ivy or something, and then you get like the little kind of blisters afterwards, that's contact dermatitis. And it's a time of type, it's a form of type four hypersensitivity. So um, okay, and then, um, so intracellular killing, uh, we said again that that was which immunodeficiency? George? Uh, with the intracellular killing of, um, that would be your chronic granulomatous disease. And then, um, type 1 interferon, so, um, does anybody remember, I think that was in Dr. Bright's lectures, does anybody remember what um, type 1 interferon release is involved in? Inflammatory? Inflammatory, yes, particularly in response to what type of pathogen? Antivirals. Virus, yep, exactly. So you have interferon alpha and interferon beta, and basically um, the cells, when they're infected with a virus, they release this and it does several things. It activates um, like uh, T cells and 
um, other um, immune system cells to start responding to that virus. Um, and additionally, what it'll do, it'll kind of cause the, neighbor, the neighboring cells to kind of um, be on guard against viral infection. Um, yep. Okay, uh, number eight. Is it E? Which one? E, the super antigen. I see where you're coming from. You're thinking like um, like a toxic shock syndrome type thing. So, um, so I, I, I see where you're coming from right here. What infection are we thinking that she probably has? Um, uh, particularly when we're talking about the um, the, the really high fever here, the um, petechiae, and then given her age group right here. Meningitis. Oh, it's probably Neisseria. Yeah, Neisseria, yeah, the Neisseria meningitis infection. You're, you're exactly right. Toxic shock syndrome could present quite similarly, but instead of petechiae, we would probably be seeing um, more of just um, the echomotic type rashes. Um, because it would be very like confluent because you just kind of have this widespread extravasation instead of little pinpoints. Also, toxic shock syndrome is generally pretty rare now, um, like currently. Um, they would generally, they would give you some sort of hint with either, um, you know, the lar um, large tampon use without very good hygiene, or um, another common one that they'll give you is, um, when we're talking about step, uh, step questions is um, nasal packing. So somebody will go into a bar and they'll get punched in the nose or something and they'll just go and stick gauze or something up there. And that'll actually, um, that's actually a, uh, the most like common association with toxic shock syndrome. Um, let's see. So yeah, so it's gonna be, so does anybody know what the answer is then if we're talking about a gram negative bacteria? C? Yep, C, exactly. And so basically that is just kind of similar to LPS. Um, they're, um, they're both released when the outer membrane of um, gram-negative bacteria are shed. And so the reason that I included this one in here is um, because, so they, what, we got a question testing us on the fact that um, LPS um, and then also LOS, which is similar, they are going to be processed via the toll-like four receptors that you have um, inside the cell. Um, you kind of just, they're just, that's kind of just like something just unfortunately just to kind of memorize. Um, another thing also that was important that I wanted to put on here, so um, Dr. Krushek particularly will like to quiz you on the um, function of different um, cytokines. And so it's important to know that this group right here, IL-1 and 6, as well as TNF-alpha, those are your major inflammatory pyretic um, cytokines. And they also facilitate, um, they're involved in, in facilitating um, shock, septic shock. Okay. Um, uh, oh, and then some, the, just a side note for step. So LPS would be found in gram-negative rods, and then LOS would be found in gram-negative oxide. I remember it because of the O right there. So, um, so A, that was capsular polysaccharide. So um, uh, for the sake of time, that one's not important, so I'll just, that would um, obviously help resist phagocytosis and complement activation. Um, immunoglobulin protease. What, um, does, any, does anybody, have y'all talked about that in lecture yet, what that one does? 
It's produced by certain bacteria, specifically Neisseria and also Strep pneumo. And what IgA does it specifically degrade? A. Yep, IgA. Yep, exactly. Um, let's see, lipotechoic acid, that's a throwback from um, GPI. That's just found in your gram-positive bacteria. Um, it stimulates complement, but it doesn't produce any sort of like toxic shock type reaction. Um, and then E, that was super antigen exotoxin, which um, uh, somebody had correctly said that that was, um, would be involved with toxic shock, toxic shock syndrome when we're talking about um, a Staph aureus infection. Okay, there's number nine. Is it D? Yep, it is. So what does she have? Nigeria meningitis. Mm -hmm. So she has a Niger Neisseria meningitis infection. And so what underlying immunodeficiency does she have? C5 to C9. Yep, terminal complement, exactly. Okay. Um, pretty self-explanatory there. So as far as the bonus questions, so um, a pure T cell dysfunction, um, what we've already mentioned it briefly, what um, immunodeficiency would be an example of a pure T cell deficiency? Good. Yes, I set myself up for that one. So that was, yes, a T cell dysfunction. Um, what would be one where you don't have any T cells um, that are produced or slash matured. To George. George, yep, there we go. Um, ineffective extracellular, or in, ineffective intracellular killing, we said that was chronic granulomatous disease, and we'll have a question about it here in a little bit. Um, insufficient IgA production. Um, so, that would, so that would occur with an isolated um, IgA deficiency, which we'll have a question on. Um, this question right here, this bonus question, is really beyond the scope of your exam. Um, and um, I, I think it's even beyond the scope of step one. I don't know what I was thinking when I put that one on there. We're going to skip it. Okay, uh, number 10. TNF alpha. So I've, I've, I feel bad that I put this one on there now that since y'all haven't had the hypersensitivity reaction, I get where you're going with, with that that would mediate like an inflammation and you're exactly right. And there will be some of that probably going on. Um, but TNF alpha is more of a systemic type in, um, inflammation. Um, this one is really all he has is, um, he hasn't really progressed uh, to the point, he hasn't really progressed to, um, to shock. So um, specifically, what type of hypersensitivity reaction would we have going on here? Type one. Type one. And so which of these up here would be involved in mediating a type one reaction? Histamine. Histamine. Histamine, yeah. That's gonna be one of the things that we have released from mast cells um, when they're activated by IG. So what that was describing right there is the wheel and flare. So if you've ever had kind of that little like white bump, but um, kind of like a white welt with a red um, surrounding it, that's the white is the wheel and the red is the flare. And that's kind of the hallmark of a type one hypersensitivity reaction. And so if you progress to anaphylactic shock, which at that point you probably would have some TNF alpha, um, TNF alpha activation there, then that's basically like you're getting a wheel and flare over your entire body. 
So the wheel and flare is caused because you kind of have this capillary permeability, these leaky capillaries. And so if you imagine that occurring everywhere in your body, you can see why anaphylactic shock is not a great thing to go into. Um, and so type one hypersensitivity is always going to present upon um, second exposure to something because first exposure, you're gonna just produce your IgM, but then um, after you get your isotype switching, then you have IgE produced and that'll um, sit bound to mast cells and basophils, um, which the difference between mast cells and basophils, basophils are in the blood, mast cells are in the tissues, just a side note. But so um, those IgEs are gonna sit bound to those. And then once you have an antigen that allows these IgEs to group together and cross-link, then that's gonna be when you're, um, the mast cells and basophils are gonna be triggered to release all of their histamines and their proteases and their inflammatory mediators. Um, that's leukotrienes and prostaglandins right there. Um, so A, let's see, that was um, C3B. So it is important to know. So what is the role of C3B in the um, complement cascade? Is that for optimization? Yes, exactly. Um, that's it, so that's it. Optimizes bacteria in the same way that an antibody would, and that enhances phagocytosis. So that's particularly important when you have encapsulated bacteria, and that's also why I don't know if you remember what I mentioned earlier, but um, a C three deficiency can dispose you, uh, predispose you to recurrent um, encapsulated bacterial infections. Um, um, it also will play a role in type 3 hypersensitivity, but that's beyond the scope of what you need to know. Um, then B, so that was IL-2. Um, what does that one do? What did y'all remember the nickname that Dr. Bright gave that? It's just for like T-cell growth and proliferation. Yes, it was T-cell. Yes, exactly. So he called, he kept calling it T-cell food. I don't know, maybe he changed the name this year, but for us, he kept calling it T-cell food because it does exactly what you just said. It um, activates them, promotes their growth, promotes their proliferation. Um, yes, exactly. Um, and so that is going to be produced by Th1 cells. That's going to be part of that cell-mediated um, uh, response. Um, and then let's see, so um, D, so lysozyme, um, what is that? So would it be- Is that what macrophages used to kill? Um, macrophages may have it, but particularly more, um, I guess more um, prominently, it's going to be in, um, so like mucosal fluid. So it's in your tears, it's in your um, sweat, saliva, and it basically it degrades the, um, the peptoglycan in bacterial cell walls. So would that make it part of the innate or adaptive immune systems? Innate. Innate, exactly, because um, it doesn't involve any kind of um, cell, um, like, uh, specialized response against an antigen. Yep. Um, and then E, that was TNF-alpha, which you already nailed. Somebody did that it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. That one is produced by both macrophages and T cells, and um, it induces um, systemic inflammation. What else does it play a role in um, maintaining? There's a, um, this will be important for step one. Uh, probably not as important for your exam coming up this Friday, but um, thinking about TB and stuff, back to that question we had earlier, um, what what do y'all think TNF-alpha plays a role in maintaining? Granulomas. Granulomas, yeah. So um, you have the interferon gamma that will initially act um, activate the macrophages to become angry phages and um, respond to the infection and form the granulomas, but then TNF-alpha subsequent to that will actually maintain um, their, um, uh, will maintain the granulomas after they've been formed. Um, okay, there's number 11.
Have y'all had the um, doctor, I think it's Grism, give y'all the allergy lecture yet and uh, parasite, allergy and parasite lecture? Or is that this week? That's gonna this be week. week. Shoot, I'm sorry guys. They had, yeah, nothing, anyhow, so I apologize. They had me kind of switch up the way I do these, so I apologize. Is that one um, complement activation, or is it, is it A? Is it A? So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, this one, yeah, this one's hard to answer without having um, that lecture yet. So I see where you're coming from with the complement. Um, but actually with parasites, we're going to have what's called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. And basically what happens is that, um, so your eosinophils, um, well, you get, you get, first you get, well, in response to the bacteria, to the parasitic infection, you get this IgE antibody production. And that's going to um, bind to both the parasite antigens and to the FC receptors on the eosinophils. And when that binding occurs, the eosinophils are going to be activated to release their, um, their contents. They're like reactive oxygen species, um, they're inflammatory cytokines, um, major basic protein. And um, so that's why it's called antibody dependent cell mediated because it depends on the antibodies, but it's actually the cells that are affecting that damage to the parasite. Um, and that's something that's specific to um, parasitic infections. Um, so looking at here, so IL-5, what, um, so obviously that is involved in stimulating eosinophils. What antibody is that involved in inducing class switching to? IgA. IgA, yep. And what would be involved in stimulating isotype switching to IgE? IL-4 and IL-13. Yep, very good. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, yep, don't worry about that. Okay. All righty. Um, so uh, C, that was complement activation. That would play a role in um, types two and three um, hypersensitivity, but not so much in parasites. Um, immediate hypersensitivity, what type of, what, what type would, of hypersensitivity would that be referring to? Type 1. Type 1, yep. And then um, MHC class 1 antigen processing, um, again, those would be um, for any kind of intracellular infection. All righty, there's the next one. This, this is another, this one is another hard one. This one is really step specific. There's one big thing that I'm getting at here. So if anybody knows this, that's awesome. If you don't, that's also totally fine. Would it be E because of the low CD4 count in HIV? See, that's what makes it difficult is that in almost any other situation, yes. Um, so, but, um, so any kind of can like mucocutaneous mu um, um, candidal infection would be a, um, would be a T lymphocyte issue. However, um, for some strange reason, um, uh, can, can, uh, um, candidemia, so a candidal infection in the blood, um, is actually going to only occur in patients um, who have uh, neutropenia. So um, particularly like chemotherapy patients is where you would see this a lot. Um, and again, that will not be tested on your exam on Friday. However, with step one, that is, um, actually a pretty important point that I saw repeated a lot and a lot. So um, I just wanted to give that to y'all now so that it will be the first time you're seeing it when you start studying for step. Um, yeah, nothing extra there. Okay, 13. Would 
Would it be F? Yes, it would. Very good. So you remembered the triad of uh, symptoms that we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Um, so let's see. So I think I already talked about that. We have that triad of eczema, um, immunodeficiency, and thrombocytopenia. Also, you have the delayed separation of the umbilical cord. It's X-linked. Um, it's a cytoskeletal issue. Um, let's see. And why, again, would this be around three to six months where we start seeing this pop up? No maternal IgG. Yep, exactly, exactly. And ultimately with this, you have to treat it with a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant. Um, okay, so A, that was aplastic anemia. Um, what are some things that could cause aplastic anemia? Because so aplastic, oh, go ahead, sorry. Parvovirus or thyroid drugs? Uh, so the parvovirus would more be just the RBC um, anemia, but uh, but yeah, you're you're thinking along the right lines of some kind of destruction to the bone marrow. So. Um, Bas uh, basically, like any kind of cytotoxic medication, like chemo is a big one. Also, radiation can cause that. Um, but basically, the hallmark of um, aplastic anemia is that you would have a pancytopenia. So you would have anemia. You would have um, an immunodeficiency because you have no white cells floating around. You would have bleeding problems because your platelets are not being made appropriately. Um, so if, you, if there's a question and you have a patient who has... Um, who has indications that it's more than one cell line that's lacking, i.e. white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, think aplastic anemia on that one. Um, so ataxia to angiectasia, that's something um, that they mention in class, but I don't think they actually will test you on. Step one will test you on it. And um, basically what that one is, it's a B and T cell deficiency. So it would be, um, it would be part of your, your skid. But um, the exam finding is they'll mention um, progressive ataxia, so um, like progressive discoordination um, with walking and with um, uh, fine movements. And then um, also the telangiectasias, which are like spider angiomas, would be um, all over the body, particularly on the face. Um, and that one you also get, um, they might describe like recurrent sinopulmonary infections. But uh, again, that's more of a step one concept. Um, Shediac Higashi syndrome, though, that is one that's testable. Um, so what is the um, issue with that one? Inability to form phagal lysosomes. Yes, exactly. So you have a um, cytoskeletal um, defect that causes improper um, um, uh, 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 targeting of, of movement. So your phagosome is not able to properly fuse uh, with your lysosome, exactly. And what is the kind of the characteristic exam finding um, in a patient who has this? Ocular albinism. I didn't quite hear that. Sorry. Ocular albinism. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, yes, the albinism would be something to look for. Um, also, they could have some peripheral neuropathy. Why do you think that would occur? So neuropathy, that would mean there's probably something wrong with the nerves. And nerves, what do they have to do? So obviously you have the neurotransmitters released at the end, but neurotransmitters are not made at the ends, they're made at the cell body. So how do they get to the end of that cell? Through the microtubules. Yes, exactly. So via the um, cellular transport, which will be defective because of the cytoskeletal um, uh, defect. So yes, um, so that would be why the nerve nerves would then be affected. Um, and then something that you would also see, they could give you a blood smear and you'll see these um, giant, gi sorry, did someone trying to get my attention? Okay, so you'll see these giant granules on the um, blood smear. So those are those little purple dots. That's just a reactive one. Don't, don't worry about that. These right here. Okay, um, then DeGeorge syndrome. Um, I'm going to skip over that because I have a question that's specifically um, talking about that here in a sec. 
And then um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, what does that occur with? E. coli and some other like uh, angiitises or vasculitises, E. coli. Yes, exactly. It occurs following a, a, an s tech so a Shiga-like toxin um, E. coli infection. And you're exactly right. You get this microangiopathic um, uh, vasculitis, which causes um, a hemolytic anemia. Um, and so basically it's manifested as um, problems with your kidneys. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, there's number 14. E? Uh, you said E like, um, yes, like IgM? IgM, uh-huh. Yep, exactly. Um, and so this is hyper IgM syndrome, a very fitting name. Um, and so with this one, you basically see um, a lot of um, recurrent mucosal infections. So like sinopulmonary, GI. Um, a lot of times these patients will look kind of sickly when you come in just because due to these recurrent infections, they don't put on weight um, appropriately. Um, and so this one is excellent for sec recep uh, recessive, um, and it's lacking that CD40 ligand, which we said was found on which cells? T cells. Yep, T cells. And um, does anybody remember the other name for the CD40 ligand? CD154. Yeah, very good. CD154. Yep, exactly. Um, and so on this one, so basically if you don't have that CD40 ligand, um, you can't induce your B cells to, um, to uh, isotype class switch. So you're just left with your IgM, which is like we said, we already said earlier, not as effective in fighting, um, in fighting off stuff. Um, and then just a tip on this one. So I don't, I, I don't know of any immunologic disorder that would cause like a hyper IgE, a hyper IgA, any of that. So if there's ever a question asking about an excess of a single immunoglobulin, um, you probably have a pretty fair bet to guess it's IgM. So, okay, there's number 15. Would it be D? Yep, it would be, absolutely. So um, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically I just, it's important to kind of know your chain of, of antigen processing. And so what's important to know here is that um, MHC2 is the one that uses the lysosome, the phagolysosome. So if the lysosome is non-functional, you're not gonna get your MHC2 presentation, not gonna be able to activate those um, CD4 cells not going to be able to have an effective extracellular antigen response. Um, let's see. A, cytokines, don't worry about that. Cytokines is basically, can be anything like interferons. It can be like tumor necrosis factor. Anything that's an inflammatory mediator is considered a cytokine. Um, integrins, we already said that that would be involved in which immunodeficiency? Leukocyte adhesion deficiency. Yep, absolutely. Um, MHC, we beat that dead horse, MHC1. Uh, oh, okay, there we go. There's
E? Yep, absolutely. What does this kid have? DeGeorge? Absolutely. Um, and so DeGeorge, you might also see it not with any of the in-house tests at the school, but when you're studying for STEP, you might see it also called velocardiofacial syndrome because um, the 22Q microdeletion actually occurs on a spectrum. So you can have varying degrees of that gene locus lost. And depending on which parts and how much you lose, um, that'll depend on exactly how much um, stuff you have that's gone wrong. Uh, if it affects the face, you can have like a cleft palate, you can have kind of a like micrognathia type, uh, small jaw type stuff going on. But um, particularly what's important for y'all is the um, third and fourth pouch failure, which would, um, the third pouch, um, that's going to be your inferior th parathyroids and your thymus. Fourth pouch is superior parathyroids because um, those two do a flip. And so what then would the lack of having parathyroids cause? Hypocalcemia. Yep, the hypocalcemia. And so a couple things that they might describe um, on an exam for a question that's wanting to cue you in as to hypocalcemia are... Um, uh, the chivo, chivostec sign, which is when you um, tap on the facial nerve and you get a twitch on that side of the face when you tap. Um, and then also trousseau, which is when you put a blood pressure cuff on the arm and you inflate it, and then you'll get this kind of carpal spasm type thing like that. Um, also, you know, seizures, tetany, muscle spasms, those could also all be signs of hypocalcemia. And then when Dr. Um, can't think of his name at the moment, um, tall, thin guy, when he comes and talks to y'all about um, the George syndrome, he will also want you to know that um, apparently for some strange reason, reason, a lot of these patients later in life are prone to schizophrenia, actually. Um, he actually had a, a test question about that um, uh, that a lot of people missed and they didn't get points back for it. So. Um, okay. Um, also, another thing that you'll see are um, uh, primarily truncus arteriosus, but also an interrupted aortic arch could occur. Those are both due to failure or faulty neurocrest cell migration. So if you see those, that could also cue you into this sy uh, syndrome as well. Um, that's just extra information right there. Don't worry about that. Okay. So um, don't worry about these because all of these are just step review type stuff and we're running out of time, so they won't be tested on your exam. Okay, there you go, 17. This is another hypersens hypersensitivity type um, uh, question here. The E? Like yep, it would be E, exactly. So what, what test is this similar to that they described? Like a PPD test. Yep, like PPD test for, um, for both tuberculosis, exactly. Oh, and I already showed it. But what type of hypersensitivity would that be? Four. Type four, yep. So your cell mediated delay type. And I talked about some other things. Um, anything that has a granuloma involved um, is gonna be type four contact dermatitis, that's your poison IV. And then we just talked about PPD, um, like for um, tuberculosis. Um, uh, and so this, so something right here. So macrophages will pretty much always be involved here but um, this could be a CDA or a CD4, just depending on the specific um, inciting antigen right there. Uh, okay, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to go? Oh, and so the reason that they would do this with Candida um, is so if you want to see if you have like um, a true T cell issue, um, you can see this is called a test for energy. And the reason we use Candida is because theoretically, um, everybody should have antigens to Canada because everybody should have been exposed to that very early on in life. Um, so you're almost guaranteed to get a positive result. And if you don't get a positive result, then um, 
then you would know that you need to do a workup for some kind of T cell pathology. Um, they'll also do this if, say, someone gets exposed to, they have a known exposure to TB, um, but their PPD is coming back negative, then what they'll do to confirm that that's a true negative on their PPD is they'll use a candida extract. Um, let's see, what, this is number 17, um, B cells, those would be basically involved in anything that requires antibodies, so types 1, 2, and 3 all require antibodies of some sort. Eosinophils, um, what type of hypersensitivity are those involved in? So those are involved in the late phase of type 1 hypersensitivity. So um, you have an early phase, which is your mast cells and IgE, and then that's followed by a late phase. So the early phase occurs in seconds to minutes, and then your late phase will occur hours later, and that involves eosinophils. Um, also, eosinophils, just as a side note, if you're ever, I guess for step one, um, if you ever um, have a patient with asthma, patients with, is with asthma, because um, that's kind of involves some type one hypersensitivity there with allergic reactions, they'll have elevated um, baseline eosinophils on, on them. Uh, and then obviously eosinophils are also involved in um, parasite defense. Uh, mast cells, that's again, what type of hypersensitivity? Type one. Mm -hmm. And then neutrophils, um, those would not be involved in any type of hypersensitivity. Okay, 18. C? B as in boy? Or C as in cat? Oh, C as in cat. Yes, there we go. That's it. Yep. Um, exactly. So what, what disease is going on here? So this would be hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, and so it occurs when um, you have maternal antibodies, which we already said would be IgG antibodies. They're directed against antigens on the fetal red blood cell surface. Um, so the most common one and probably the most significant one is um, the rhesus antigen, also called the D antigen. And um, Dr. Bright likes to stress that um, what's the treatment for that one? Rogam. Rogam, yep. And um, you can also have ABO incompatibility, um, which is a little bit, a little bit different. Um, and that doesn't always occur every time you have the mix match between mom and baby. Um, so what type of test is, are, is going to be positive um, when you're talking about um, he, uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn? Wouldn't it be for the mom indirect, but for the baby direct Coombs test? Yeah. Yes, that is correct. So direct means that the antibodies are already present, they're already attached, and then indirect means that you have the component there, but um, uh, but since you don't have the, the cells there, then you're not going to have the um, di positive direct test. Exactly. And they will, um, she will, you expect to see some sort of um, diagnostic testing question on your test, whether it's Coombs or um, uh, ELISA, um, expect to see something like that on your test. Um, beyond that, I don't think you really need to know the like specific symptomology that you would see there. Um, but do know that basically sensitization, particularly when we're talking about RH incompatibility, sensitization will occur um, during the first pregnancy, but that child will be asymptomatic. It'll be upon the second pregnancy um, of an RH positive child to an RH negative mother that you'll see um, uh, symptoms, uh, uh, active symptoms. Um, don't worry about that. That's talking about like sickle cell and thalassemia, which y'all haven't even had yet. So don't worry about that. Um, G6PD, they'll talk about that later. 
Um, important right here, just kind of a side note. So E, that was talking about RBC lysis by um, beetle antibodies. Uh, something just to kind of just a good general rule of thumb, uh, babies and fetuses immune systems are very immature. Um, that's why you can't give them live virus vaccines and stuff when they're born. Um, so the odds of them being able to mount an autoimmune response are pretty low there. All right, 19. Is it B, catalase? Yeah, good job. That's really good, yeah. Um, so this one, I don't, at least for us, they didn't really go over it in class, but it ended up being kind of a huge deal on step. And so, um, yeah, so what disease are we talking about here? What disease are they describing? Is this chronic granulomatis? Absolutely, yes. And so we said earlier that that could be X-linked recessive or autosomal recessive. X-linked recessive is a more common type, and it's going to affect NADPH oxidase. The other one would be um, uh, MPO, I believe. Um, and um, so basically what happens is your neutrophils and things are able to phagocytize bacteria, fungi, whatever, effectively, but then they can't um, produce the, the respiratory bursts, the superoxides um, and reactive oxygen species that kill the um, whatever they just gobbled up. So they'll continue to just um, uh, proliferate within the cell, um, phagolysosome. Um, and, but however, there is kind of a caveat to that in that a lot of times um, bacteria, because they're in this confined space, they'll end up kind of um, killing themselves in their own toxin production. Um, and so, however, if a, um, if, if, a, if a bacterial cell or fungal cell is able to produce catalase, then that catalase will um, uh, destroy those toxins, um, uh, will destroy those toxins itself and um, not really be affected by um, the reactive oxygen species that it's producing, if that makes sense. So um, uh, that's, again, probably not gonna be tested on your in-house exam but that'll be something um, that Steph will test you on. Um, you also see, as the name would suggest, um, diffuse granulomas everywhere. And so there's two tests, which I have a question about these tests here in a second, but um, you can use DHR, which um, that's dihydrorhodamine. That's the most commonly used one, and you're looking for like a green fluorescence on flow cytometry. And then this is nitro blue uh, tetrazoleum, or tetrazoleum, um, and that one is, um, you would have a, uh, a, a blue, uh, it would turn blue when you add the patient's neutrophils. It's an older test. Let's see. Um, um, that was beta lactamase. Don't worry about that. Coagulase, blah, 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 blah. Okay, 20. This is one of Dr. Williams' favorite diseases. Is it A? It is, yep, exactly. So um, adenosine, uh, adenosine deaminase, um, so it's, uh, when it, it is a form of skid, second most common form of skid, and um, so it, um, it's gonna be deficient in any cell throughout the body, 
but it's particularly gonna, its effects are gonna be the most apparent in cells that rapidly um, divide and proliferate, which immune cells qualify for that category. Um, and so what it normally does is um, it gets rid of excess adenosine, um, but when it's not there, adenosine builds up and starts getting the way in the way of cellular function. Um, you'll have a deficiency of both B and T cells because they're both rapidly dividing. And basically, um, the treatment is a stem cell transplant. Um, but, you know, sadly, a lot of times there's not a match available. And so that's where they, it was actually the first disease to ever be successfully treated with um, retroviral gene therapy. So that's a fun fact that gets you nowhere in life. Um, okay. Uh, does anybody know what the most common uh, cause of skid is? Is it the IL-2 receptor? Absolutely, IL-2 receptor. IL-2 is T-cell food, so if they can't get that food, they're gonna die. And do you know what form of inheritance that is? I think X-linked. Yep, way to go, good job. Um, let's see, um, so myeloperoxidase deficiency, that one probably, again, won't be tested on your in-house exam, but on STEP it will be tested. So just so you can kind of have a, an idea of what that is. So myeloperoxidase is important in producing um, bleach and chloride inside the phagolysosome. And so that's particularly important in killing, um, uh, uh, gosh, I just forgot the word, um, whatever candida is. What, what are those called? Uh, wow, Amanda. Um, Anyways, okay. yeast, there we go. Okay. Sorry, well, fu did you say fungi? That's the same thing. Yeah, can yeast, candida. So you'll get recurrent um, candidal infections everywhere, but um, everything else, um, all the rest of the immune system will still pretty much stay intact. Um, NAD uh, pH oxidase deficiency, we, that one is your chronic granulomatous disease. Um, reverse transcriptase, that's um, a fun fact, that's Part of what's used um, in this retroviral gene therapy, but other than that, not really important. Um, and then um, xanthine oxidase, that's involved in uric acid degradation. That's for gout and flesh and ions and that kind of great stuff. Okay, 21. Would this one be another NADPH oxidase? It absolutely would. He has um, crani uh, chronic granulomatous disease as well. So I'm not going to talk about that one much, but um, you should be able to, um, the on the test, the dihydrorhodamines, the DHR, or the NBT testing, both of those are fair game um, on the test. So you're looking for either green, green fluorescence on flow cytometry or a color change to blue with the NBT. Um, let's see, are these bonus questions worth answering? No, I don't think so. All right, there you go. Is it B? B as in boy? As in dog. As in dog. So I see where you're coming from because of the macrophage T cell um, uh, uh, communication. So this one, this one's kind of a tricky one. Um, this one is actually, oh my gosh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry, I was, I'm sorry. It's been a long day, y'all. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. So yes, interfere on gamma, yes, and yes. Oh my God, yes, I'm so sorry, yes, yes, uh, yes, because your macrophages produce your IL-12, and in response, your T cells produce your um, interferon gamma, the um, response to it. And that would be a part of, would that be a Th1 or Th2? One. One, yes, absolutely. Um, 
I don't think there's anything else important. Oh, this is important. IL-10, what does that cytokine do? Anti-inflammatory. One more time? Oh, yes. Anti yes. Yes, anti-inflammatory. That's unique in that it's kind of the, I mean, there are some other ones, but that's kind of the major anti-inflammatory cytokine. So yeah, that's important to keep in mind. Um, All right, there you go. This one is another one, probably not testable for y'all um, in the on your um, unit test, but is testable for um, for your uh, step one. And this was kind of a really big deal on step one. And for this, also think vancomycin would have a very similar um, uh, uh, similar presentation here with Redmond syndrome, if that helps. D, as in dog. So no, you're saying. Are you thinking um, serum sickness? Is that what you're thinking? Oh, I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a hard question, and yeah, when I saw this, I was like, what in the world is going on? So this is actually going to be. Um, it's a hist it's a why it's a red man syndrome. They didn't really talk about why it happens in class, but so um, it happens because of widespread histamine release, um, which occurs from mast cells. And um, but it doesn't involve IgE because normally, right, we talk about type one hypersensitivity, and you have your IgE that um, uh, is what act IgE crosslinking as it binds antigen is what causes the mast cells to degranulate. But in this, so um, opioids and vancomycin are really kind of the two major players here. And they will go and actually directly activate mast cells via a different um, receptor. So um, that's something that step one really likes to test and um, they didn't really mention it um, here in class. Um, and basically, it's just red man syndrome is what it is. Um, and so the point here is that so that's IgE independent and an IgE dependent would be your type 1 hypersensitivity. OK, there you go. There's 24. We're almost done. We're almost done. D, right? Yep, D, absolutely. Good job. Um, yes, so what type of, react, of hypersensitivity reaction, reaction would this be? Type 1 anaphylaxis. Yes, exactly. And so, yes, you're exactly right. That was going to be my next question. So it's type 1 hypersensitivity, and he has actually crossed the line, gone into anaphylaxis, as evident by instability of vital signs. So, yes, absolutely. And um, the, the important thing here is that um, the, so the IgE is actually always bound to the FC receptors on the mast cells and basophils. Um, and it's the antibody binding that brings them together because the epitopes are very close to each other. Epitope, remember, is what the um, antibody binds to. And so those are very close together and they bring them together and allow for that cross-linking to occur that then initiates um, degranulation. Um, that's just what I said. Um, let's see. Um, so immune complex def deposition and endothelium, what type of hypersensitivity would y'all call that? Three. Yep, exactly. Type three. Um, antibody dependent uh, cell mediated cytotoxicity, 
that is um, what we talked about earlier with our um, with our um, parasitic reaction with eosinophils. Um, also, it can occur in some type two hypersensitivities. Um, CD8 mediated hypotoxicity, hypo, hypertoxicity. What type of, um, God, what am I even saying? CD8 mediated hypersensitivity. What type of um, hypersensitivity would that be if it was CD8 mediated? Type one. So, so the CD8, remember, that's going to be your cell mediated. So that would be type four, type four. Type one would be mass. I see where you were going. You were going with cell mediated. So, but no, CD8 would be type, any kind of T cell is going to be type four. Um, type one, the cells involved would be your mass cells and basophils. Um, and then complement mediated um, cytotoxicity, that's type two or type three. Okay, um, 25. Is it C? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so this right here is a C1 inhibitor deficiency. So normally um, C1 prevents um, the cleavage of the, of the subsequent components, so C2 and C4, and um, prevents the um, complement cascade from occurring. Um, so Several things can happen. If you have a deficiency of that, then you're going to constantly be using up your complements. So you'll have low complement titers. Um, but also, so C1 inhibitor um, also blocks um, another pathway, which basically um, produces bradykinin is the end result there. And bradykinin causes angioedema. Um, you probably remember Actually, no, because y'all haven't had cardiac drugs yet. That's in the spring. So that'll be big when we're talking about ACE inhibitors. That'll be kind of a big problem, but that's for then. Um, but anyhow, so basically with C1 inhibitor deficiency, you're going to have low complement levels, which can predispose to infection. And then also you're going to have um, high levels of bradykinin, um, which can predispose to swelling. A lot of the, the um, like classic presentation will be swollen lips. Um, I specifically remember a picture on my step exam of these big swollen lips. And that's also testable for your in-house exam. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I asked a random Brady Kynan question. Yeah, go ahead. So in anatomy, I seem to remember Dr. Carr telling me that when babies are born and they take their first breath, bradykinin is activated and that's what causes them to have like all this vasodilation to make their lungs work and all this jazz. Is that the same idea? Like, is that accurate? It makes sense because bradykinin is involved in vasodilation. I was prostaglandins when she said that, wasn't it? Do what? Was, it, was that not prostaglandins? I mean, I, I that's, oh, yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say. I think it's yeah. more of a prostaglandin. So I know for sure that prostaglandins are involved in um, closure or preventing the closure of um, like your um, uh, ductus arteriosus. Um, so the uh, placental prostaglandins keep that open. And then once you separate, then um, the lack of prostaglandins causes that to close. With the, as far as taking the baby taking their first breath and that um, uh, uh, causing the decreased um, uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, that, I, that is more um, along the lines of um, because, within the fetus, your lungs are collapsed and fluid filled. And then once you get this oxygen in them, oxygen, um, if you remember from MOS, oxygen um, in the lungs um, acts to vasodilate. So hypoxemic areas constrict and um, oxygen rich areas vasodilate. And that dilating of the capillaries um, reduces the resistance, which allows more blood to then flow into the pulmonary circulation um, instead of bypassing it through um, the uh, patent foramen ovale. And that's what helps to increase the left atrial hypertension and shut that flap. Um, 
did I just completely go off on a tangent or because you were asking about Brady Kynan. So I guess my final, my final answer is that I don't, I don't particularly know what Brady, what role Brady Kynan plays in um, the respiratory circulatory system of a newborn. Um, it makes sense, I guess, that it could be involved because it is involved in vasodilation, but um, I can't tell you for sure. So. Well, that was, <laughs> you're a genius. That's all I have to say. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I'm not helping y'all very much with this session, but I apologize well, if it's. Yeah, no, you're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad then. Okay. Um, we're almost, and if y'all have any questions, please ask me because I want y'all to get something out of this session. And so I'm not sure if that's fully occurring at this point. So ask questions, please. Um, there's number 26 for y'all. Is it B? Yep, it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and um, because C3B is going to be what opsonizes um, the, uh, um, the, um, the, the bacteria or fungus or whatever we're talking about. Exactly. And so I have a list right here of the different opsonins. So IgG obviously is a major one. C3B we just mentioned. MBL, that's that, um, that's that lectin pathway. Um, so mannose binding lectin, I believe, that's what that is. And then also um, CRP, that is um, C-reactive protein. I think that'll be next unit when y'all talk about that, but that can also serve as a minor, very minor opsonin. Um, that's increased, increased when you have, increased when you have inflammation. Um, and also something important to remember is that all three complement pathways are going to converge on C3B. That's kind of like the key pivotal point. Um, what does C3A do? Anaphylatoxin, is that the word? It's like yeah, swelling. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, you're exactly right. That's exactly what it does. So it goes off and it promotes um, uh, inflammation and it also serves as like a chemo tactic to some extent to recruit cells to um, wherever the, the action's happening. Um, and then C3B, um, what else does it do besides act as an opsonin? Well, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Recruits more opsonin. Oh, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, you're exactly right. So it will bind to C3B convertase um, and it will um, form C5 convertase. And that will begin the whole um, MAC formation uh, cascade there. Um, so it, um, it kind of has a dual function. Opsonizes to help with phagocytosis, also um, forms the C5 convertase that triggers MAC formation. Um, Amanda? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I talked myself out of the right answer on this one because I was like, oh, wait, it said phago. Uh, hang on, can you go back? It said, where was it? It said phagocytosis or phagocytosis. Um, is because I don't think I, I've never really thought of the complement system as like being a phagocytotic system. Is that um, inaccurate? So you, so you went with what, with D? Is that what you I, I was, yeah, I, was, I, well, like, I was like, oh, yeah, like, my initial gut reaction is B, and then I was like, wait, it says phagocytosis. I'm not really feeling like that's correct, and then I was, like, starting to try and select a better answer. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so with, you're, you're right and you're wrong. So on, um, as far as C3B acting as an opsonin, it does do so with a lot of different antigens, um, and that facilitates phagocytosis. 
you're right in the fact that there's a particular, if, um, if bacteria have a particular virulence factor, C3B is basically ineffective. What virulence factor would that be? Anybody can answer that one. So like think strep pneumo, think nice. Yes, exactly, a capsule. So um, if they have a, um, if they have that, um, that polysaccharide capsule, then that kind of renders our C3B ineffective. So in that sense, it would not be a very good um, opsonizing protein. And that's why we have to have um, uh, vaccinations um, that specifically um, that involve um, an antigen from that capsule. So like for instance, your um, strep pneumo vaccine, excuse me, that involves part of the, um, the actual capsule so that we can induce IgG to that capsule and thereby regain our opsonizing ability of that. Does that make sense? Uh, another, another important thing right here, so as far as D, um, something that's important to remember is um, IgM is not a true opsonizing protein in that it cannot, um, it cannot um, activate, uh, like uh, it doesn't help facilitate the, um, to the same extent the IgG does the um, phagocytosis or the complement activation because it's a pentamer, so that FC portion is all bound in the middle, if that makes sense. Um, okay, thank you, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry, that, and, and these, I, I need to stress that these are really super hard questions. These are, harder than what you'll see on the in-house exam. These are, these are step styled stuff. And, um, and they'll, they'll, even if you, even if you know your stuff, they're still going to be difficult. So yeah, these, um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, bonus questions on this one. No, those, I don't think you need to. Uh, so we said C3A is that anaphylactotoxin. Um, and then what is the other, what is its kind of counter component? C3A and what else? What else? C5A. Yep, C5A, exactly. Um, do you know if on the, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, um, go ahead. For the unit tests, do you know if we have to know like the, um, the subtypes of C3 convertase um, at all? like the C3, 2B, 3B, all those, like, I, I don't know if you've seen those any time. They're in on King, that's the only reason I ask, and like some people have mentioned them, but. Um. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think back to my test. I don't think, I don't, I don't really remember, and I don't want to say that and there being a question and yeah, no worries. That's, might crucify that's, me, that. but I don't remember there being a question regarding anything that didn't have a pathologic consequence. Okay. Um, that goes. To answer that question, I think that she said that if it was the alternate pathway, that it's like the C3 BBB that you have to know, but for the classical and the MBL or MLB, whatever that is, sorry, um, that one, she would just call it the classical convertase on the exam. Okay, thanks so much. And I also, if I remember correctly with those, there's even kind of like a controversy out there because they had it named one way and then they, they re, sometime in recent history, they renamed it a different way to fit the scheme that had already been established. So um, like even if you look in the literature, I think there's some discrepancy as to what's called what, if, I, if I'm thinking correctly. Amanda, were you specifically talking about your step one exam about like the naming of the convertases? Yeah. We, like like what we were just talking about, like the C three BBB. Are we no, talking I, about the the shelf or like our? I was talking. I was talking about y'all's in house exam. Oh, okay. Thank you. There was absolutely nothing on it on step. There was okay. But, straight. Thanks. Well, I was talking about the in house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. And then IgM. I think I misspoke just a second ago. IgM can activate complement, but it doesn't facilitate phagocytosis. I think I might have said that backwards, but um, but to correct myself if I did say it wrong, IgM. Yes, activate complement. No, activate sad phagocytosis. Um, let's see. B4, uh, leukotriene B4, what does that do? That's important. 
Vasodilation? Probably does some of that. Lou, that's a good guess anytime you're generally talking about leukotrienes. Particularly, it's chemotactic for what? Neutrophils. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. Um, okay, and then selectins, we said those were on the um, vasculature that facilitates neutrophil extravasation and lymphocyte transmission. Okay, here's 27. Another hypersensitivity question. Would it be F? Mm -hmm, absolutely. What type of hypersensitivity is this? Four. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, so this is specific. So this is called contact dermatitis. It occurs with um, like poison ivy, poison oak, poison anything green that you kind of want to add after that. It also occurs with nickel. That could be another thing that they use, um, like a belt buckle or some kind of jewelry. Um, and uh, just like with any type of um, uh, uh, just, just like with type 1 hypersensitivity, their first has to be sensitized on first exposure, and then on second exposure, exposure is when you actually get the reaction. Some exceptions, if it's a really, really strong antigen, you can get it on the first reaction, but we're not going to worry about that. And I mentioned this earlier, but it can be CD4 or CD8 cells that are um, uh, providing this response. If you're talking about like granuloma formation, um, or like the, if you're talking about like the PPD, testing. That one, um, uh, PPD specifically is going to be CD8, the, um, but other types could be CD4. Um, and something which is not going to be super important on your this in-house exam because you're not really going to have a differential that you have to form, but on step one, something that will help you determine that this is contact dermatitis via hype type 4 hypersensitivity versus, say, some other kind of maybe infectious etiology or some kind of um, um, uh, like autoimmune type thing is the linear streaks. You would see linear streaks if something, some kind of plant had brushed across your skin. That's kind of um, special. But, um, okay, let's see. Um, basophils mast cells, we said that's what type of hypersensitivity? Type one. Type one. Yep. All those others we're not going to worry about. All right. Uh, let's see. Number 28. This one's in here because it has to do with ELISA, which you'll get a question on. Are there no epitopes in common? Yeah, exactly, no epitopes. So um, what's happening here is uh, it's, um, um, when you do a lysa or any kind of um, immunoassay, you have your, um, you have your, um, uh, uh, it, you kind of have that sandwich, right? So you have um, something there to grasp on to your antigen, and then you're going to have 
Um, so generally it's a, some kind of um, uh, antibody there to grasp onto your antigen. Then you have your um, uh, uh, antigen specific immunoglobulin, and then you're gonna have a lot of times, you'll have then a secondary immunoglobulin that recognizes the FC portion of that first antibody. And then on its end, it has some kind of um, signal thing. So that could be the um, horse, uh, horseradish peroxidase, um, could be a variety of things. Um, so basically what you need to know here is that, so epitopes, which is what the um, antibodies bind to, if they, had, if they had some sort of shared epitope, then as you increase the concentration of the second antigen, you would have, um, it would compete for that initial antigen that's radio labeled. So you would have something that goes down like that because it's going to displace it from the epitopes that they're bound to. You won't see a question like this one on your in-house exam. You will see a question about immunoassays probably more than likely on your in-house exam, but this type of question could be fair game for step one. Hey Amanda. Yes. On that graph, how would you tell if it was the same most or some? That you probably wouldn't be able to because um, uh, unless you had something to compare to, um, basically the slope of the graph would be what told you which one is which. And um, you really wouldn't unless you had a series of them to compare to. Uh, I guess you could see a kind of a plateauing off if it wasn't um, all the, if it wasn't complete sharing of epitopes, but um, you also may not. It just depends on how many epitopes they have in common and what the ratio of antibodies to that particular an, uh, epitope is versus antibodies to other epitopes. So that's a good question, and they probably wouldn't be able to ask that question if the answer was anything except for no epitopes in common. Thank you. Yeah. Um, don't worry about those. That's exactly what I was just saying. Um, okay. Here's the next one for you. A than N NK cells? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, so for this question here, um, sh she kind of makes a big deal about it. Dr. Krushek does with NK cells. That entire lecture for me was a nightmare. I just had to kind of look over it the night before the exam and hope that she asked something that I had a slight idea about. You, a lot of that stuff is like very research kind of in its infancy type stuff. You won't see it on step at all. Maybe you'll see a general question about this. I doubt you'd even see a question like this on, on step. But unfortunately, there'll be one or two questions about it on your test. So I would just kind of recommend going through that. And I'm not a fan of, you know, memorize and regurgitate and forget. But that lecture, you can memorize, regurgitate, and forget. Um, are you referring to like a bunch of like the um, ligands and stuff like her, you know, like the CD48, the 2B4, all of the different, like what are you talking about specifically there? Yeah, in that she had, it's like a, I think for y'all, it's like an independent study session and it's like all about um, NK cells and about this different type and they have these different receptors that are very subspecialized and um, I think, I think it might have been on Friday, this past Friday for y'all. Am, am I right? Okay. On? Uh, it was like, yeah, or something yesterday or today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one. It's all about NK cells. And unfortunately, you have, there'll be a couple questions on the test from that lecture. Um, but you won't see any of them on this step exam. Oh, one thing I would say, one thing, if there was one thing to focus on in that lecture, she likes the bright versus dark. Um, so one thing to take away is that CD56, that will be on, um, that is an NK cell identifier, so that's something important to know. And the other thing that's important to know, because she talks about the bright versus dim, and basically the ones that are bright have a higher density of CD56, because that's what they're tagging with that fluorescence. And um, the ones that are brighter are less good at killing, if that makes sense. So that, that, I would say, if there was one important takeaway message from that lecture, that would be it. Unfortunately, she'll probably ask one question about all those weird receptors that you mentioned, but she really likes this stuff right here. 
Okay, and then number 30, last one. Okay, we're almost there. All right. Is this ABO incompatibility? No, it, and, um, so on that one, uh, we would have expect to see. Oh, it's oh, never mind. Yeah, yeah, that'd be more of an infancy thing. Oh wow, I was so rushed to get done that I was like, oh yeah, let's just pick the easy answer. <laughs> you're good. Oh, I see where you're coming from though with the transfusion there. Yeah, so that that could happen, um, but yeah, with the O negative. Would it be the selective IgA deficiency? Yes, it is. And um, Dr. Tarbox, that was the name I was looking for earlier when I talked about the schizophrenia with the DeGeorge syndrome. He'll give a talk on this. I think it'll be him. I'm almost certain it's him. And he likes this deficiency as well. Um, and so with um, IgA deficiency, really these patients are by and large just like normal, no real problems, um, except they might have some like sinopulmonary and GI problems. And so why would they specifically have problems with those two things? Mucosal membranes. Exactly, because IgA is a mucosal um, immunoglobulin and obviously those two symptoms have mucosal membranes. And for STEP, not particularly for in-house exams, but for STEP, one of the kind of like trigger words for GI infections would be a Giardia infection. Um, those patients are going to be particularly susceptible um, for some reason when they lacked IgA to a Giardia infection. Um, they also will have a higher incidence of autoimmune disease, patients with IgA deficiency. Um, not exactly sure the etiology on that, but something to keep in mind. And then, um, but this one is kind of, the last bullet here is kind of a big thing. It's, um, they'll, if you don't give them washed RBCs, which I think next unit you'll have a guy come from like the like blood bank or something-ish that the hospital has, and he'll talk to you about a bunch of different um, like cell products and like all these different types of reactions. And um, he'll talk to you about what washed versus packed and stuff like that is. But basically, um, if you don't give them these washed, cleaned um, products, then they'll still have serum IgA um, in whatever you're giving them in the um, plasma. And because their own bodies don't have IgA, they'll recognize the IgA from the donor as foreign, and then they'll have this widespread um, anaphylaxis going on. So that's kind of a, like the big thing that happens here. And basically the way you diagnose it is just like it sounds, low IgA, everything else is normal. And that's actually the most common immune deficiency. Um, luckily it's not something worse, so. Um, let's see, were these bonus questions anything worth answering? Uh, ABO, like we said, that would be something, that would be if the recipient was giving something other than type O. Um, C1 inhibitor deficiency, that would be that um, what we talked about earlier with the angio, hereditary angioedema. Um, we talked about leukocyte adhesion deficiency. We talked about skid. Okay. Alrighty. So, I apologize. A lot of that went into a lot more depth than y'all need to know for the exam. The, the idea was that since we, um, since y'all are just pass fail without even a rank, that, um, you know, y'all would want, y'all would maybe direct some of your um, studying efforts, I guess, towards step one earlier on in the, um, throughout your MS2 year. But um, anyhow, so, um, if um, I'm not going to be the one giving y'all the next two for the next, um, I, Craig, I believe will give you your unit two. I don't know who's giving your unit three yet, but I'll come back and I'll have a presentation for something to give y'all um, during um, your uh, next block. So um, in the meantime, if y'all have a preference, whether y'all like it this way better, or if y'all like it more kind of like where I lecture to y'all better, y'all could let me know in the meantime. But do y'all have any questions for me right now? Anything that I can help y'all with? Will you take my exam for me? <laughs> uh, I, girl, you're on your own on that one. I apologize. That's really rude and inconsiderate of you. <laughs> so 
Hey, let me, I guess I could pull up the chat to see. I guess, let me stop screen sharing there. And then, okay. So anyhow, if y'all want a copy of, um, uh, of this um, recording, or if you, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll just post the PowerPoint to Facebook. Um, but then if you want a copy of the recording, um, just send me an email and I'll get to that. And y'all are so welcome. I hope, I feel like this wasn't as, um, as, uh, as helpful as in the past. So I feel like there's a lot of extraneous stuff, but I hope y'all get something out of it. So. It was really helpful. Like, okay. really helpful. Okay. Insanely helpful. Okay, good. Helpful and calm my anxiety a lot. Okay, well, good. And, and rest assured that these questions are so much harder than what you'll see on your in-house exam. So if y'all could answer these, you'll blow that test out of the water. And if you couldn't answer these, you might still blow that test out of the water because these are insanely hard. So. I'll hang around until um, everybody leaves in case you wanna ask me a question once people leave or anything like that, so. Hi Amanda, thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. And y'all feel free to email me or whatever if you have any um, questions that you think of between now and test day or anything. I have a real quick question for you actually. Um, do you know, so um, for T cells um, and how they're supposed to be like intracellular, do you have any um, explanation for why they also work with fungus or fungi? Just because like those are extracellular and from my understanding it's the fact that like the um, macrophages and like the basically they can't be tagged by opsins and like and ingested fully and digested. That's why they can't be like. Um, but that's why it's not like humoral immunity. But I I haven't gotten like a great explanation on that, and no pressure to. But just if you knew, um, like why T cells are or why fungi are T cell mediated. So, you, so you so just to be clear. You're asking why it's T cell versus in um, antibodies. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, T cell. So, so, like, why it's cell mediated, mediated versus humoral? Sorry, I was poorly worded. But. No, no, you're good. So I don't have a great answer for you. Um, my initial, like, if I had to give like a knee-jerk reaction, would be that um, because um, fungi are kind of a different type of organism versus bacteria, they're not going to be necessarily susceptible to the same. Um, uh, defenses that bacteria are. Um, they have, a, you know, a different cell wall structure. They have different enzymes and things that they produce. Um, and a lot of times they can be larger. And so they're not as amenable. I, I think you kind of said this in asking your question. They're not as amenable to phagocytosis and destruction. And so a lot of times our best defense is to just try to kind of wall them off with that granuloma formation, which is why it would induce the um, the uh, Th1 response. Okay, right, that makes sense. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that actually makes sense. Awesome. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any other reason I could think of right off the top of my head, but yeah, I think it just kind of stems from the fact that they they have they're not as susceptible to the normal defenses as bacteria would be. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna peace out. But thanks so much. Yeah, really of course, of course. I'm glad it was helpful. Um, I have a random. Can I get clarification about one question real quick? Yeah, sure thing. Just a random thing that was just kind of mentioned, but mm -hmm. on the Coombs test, you said the direct was for something and the indirect was for something else. Could you yeah, so the direct Coombs test is what you would do on the baby, and um, that would be indicative, basically a positive direct Coombs means that you have the cells and they have antibodies actually bound to them. Okay. Um, yeah, and then indirect, would mean that you have the antibodies, but you don't have the cells that they're bound to. So you kind of have to do an extra step in the testing process, which is why it's called indirect. And so that would be like the mom. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I did not understand that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good night.
I appreciate it. Yeah, you too. You too. Thanks for coming. I just want you to know the wind blowing in your hair makes you look like a supermodel. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that boosts my confidence. <laughs> it's just an old box fan, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that any day. Oh, I had asked you like a question in the chat, but um, I'll just ask. Um, how do you get to like memorize material to this extent and not forget? Um. I don't, I don't know if I... <laughs> um, like, how do you study to be able to, like, remember? Well, so how I studied for the, lec for the lecture exams is not anything super fancy, unfortunately. I just, honestly, the, the lecture, like, actual material, the slides, those were kind of like my gospel truth for, um, for, the, for class. And, um, you know, obviously any pathoma assignment, I went through that. I did all the... Um, you know, like, I call them extracurricular activities, but, you know, all the, like, um, uh, like the conference, I went to all the conference things that she had, little presentation conferences. Some of those were more helpful than others, but really my baseline strategy was just, I would, I would go to, I would go to lecture and I'd watch it through once, um, kind of almost as if I was, I, I honestly got to the point where I didn't really even take notes. I just kind of watched it to try to, like, under, like, keep up with what they were saying and kind of just see it once. Then I would go back home and I would flip through the lecture slides and I would take notes off of the slides in a spiral. And then what I would do is like the day or two before, I would go back through and I would just read through all the notes that I wrote. And it would usually fill up like a three or four subject notebook. So it would take a lot of time to read back through them. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had some kind of special. And also too, I did just kind of come off of step one, you know, about a month the two month month I, recently so in in end of june so that also too was kind of working in my favor because i saw all this stuff again so oh, okay so you were just religiously focusing on lecture and just pretty much you could okay. begin but yeah but oh, sorry. lecture yeah lecture honestly everything will come from lecture except for the specific pathoma chapters, but everything else will come from lecture in some shape or form, and that was always what I banked off of. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much again. Yeah, you're so welcome. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. And I'm not just like staring at you or anything. I'm reading through the group chat to see if there was any questions that I missed that anybody wouldn't be like shoot an email about. Alrighty, do you have anything, Thomas, or are you? Okay, so I'm gonna head on out then. So thank you for coming if you're still listening.